thanks to David Ben-Gurion in a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to pay him a personal debt. In the year of 1963, on the occasion of the founding ceremony of Midrash al Zeboker, David Ben-Gurion, like other great leaders, presented his I have a dream speech. And I'm quoting, you might think I'm a fanatic devotee or a hopeless ignoramus, but I dream of a sort of a Hebrew Oxford in the Negev, a sort of a modern Yavne. When the Ben-Gurion law was enacted in the Knesset in 1976, this dream started to be realized. Ben-Gurion University of the Negev took upon itself to be the guardian of Ben-Gurion's archives, and not less importantly, to fulfill his modern Yavne vision, a center for scholarship dedicated to the study of the Israel phenomena. The Israel phenomena as a whole, as an idea, as a culture, as a society, and as a polity. And here we are, four decades later, the Institute's faculty and professionals backed up with the university's devotion and trust, decided to disperse this knowledge throughout the whole world. A visionary and quite pretentious, I have to say, project that today has turned into a dream come true, thanks to Wayne, Lisa, Arnie, and Roberta. Our students come from all over the world. We asked five of them to tell us here today, this morning, what brought them to the Israel Studies field and what attracted them to the Negev. So before we pursue with our ceremony and formal uh, part of the, of the event, let's hear together what our students have to say. Choosing to study at Ben-Gurion University at the Stable Care campus was really about being in such a beautiful environment with some of the top academics in the world and an enriching and engaging peer community. The BGU Israel Studies program is located in the Negev, which is the heart of what Israel Studies discussions are all about. The BGU Israel Studies is also host to many experts within the field of Israel Studies. I think for Israel, it's important to have internationals to speak on behalf of the country. Sometimes it's a better reputation when a third person says something about you. This is a place where everyone is helping each other, everyone is supporting each other, and everyone is there for you. My perception about Israel is of a global and cosmopolitan country that attracts many international students, truly a light for all nations. I hope that I'm able to improve the exchange between Israel and Brazil. There are lots of interesting contributions to be made by both sides. The studies improved my perception about Israel and knowing how Israel got its greatness within a short period of time. I see myself as an ambassador of Israel. I would strongly recommend the people to come down here and see it themselves and experience all the beauties that Israel has to offer. 
I plan to approach my PhD and start my academic career to give Israel a positive representation. We were surprised to see that the Israel phenomena is attracting students from all over the world, representing a variety of religions and cultures from places we couldn't even imagine will be attracted to this topic. Our graduates are already becoming ambassadors of Israel in their own countries. I envision them in significant positions, making a real difference. We've spent quite a bit of time at these meetings reflecting on the early days of Bungon University. What distinguished us? We were tasked with fulfillment of the vision of David Bungon. He foresaw, as Paula already read to us, an Oxford and Yavne in the desert. He had led the way through personal example, unfortunately, not too many followers, but still a very strong personal example. The instructions he felt he left upon his death provided that his, his archive, the centerpiece of Israel's first presidential library, would become the living core of an institute that would bear his name and which would anchor the study of Israel, of how this state came to be. So it is here that the unique program for the study of Israel began. It is here that this program has, over time, evolved beyond its original mandate to serve as a gathering point for outstanding young Israeli scholars to become a worldwide center for Israel studies, a home for what will be known from this morning on as the Woodman Scheller Israel Studies International Program. I first met Wayne Woodman and his wife, Lisa Scheller, through Lisa's parents. Ernie and Roberta Scheller have been devoted friends and partners of this university for many years. Ernie was long passionate about promoting opportunities for young people to become engaged with BGU, and so it was natural for him to encourage Wayne to take a leadership role. But Wayne did not just go along with his father-in-law's wishes. He looked very carefully at what was happening here in Israel and realized that AABGU could become something more. His vision for engaging mid-career young people with the pioneering work of the university became the Zinn Fellows Leadership Program, which he and Lisa brought to life nearly five years ago, and from which has sprung a growing tide of new leadership for AABGU and Ben Gurion University. Named for the Zin Wilderness Overlooking, where Ben Gurion chose to be buried, Zin's academic curriculum draws extensively for the field of Israel studies. And the Institute's director, the head of the Israel Studies International Program, our dear Paula Caballo, has been a core member of the Zin faculty from its very first day. Over the course of the past five years, Wayne and Lisa have drawn increasingly close to the program and to the institute. They have been full participants in each of the first two cohorts of Zin, as they are in the third, which is actually taking place right now. Wayne has visited the university on his own or in the company of friends and colleagues each year, serving, maybe sometimes more than once a year, serving as a guest lecturer to graduate students in Israel studies. He has also brought potential guests on several occasions, helping to broaden exposure to the university and providing us with access to great minds and insights about broader political dynamics. 
A leading member of the AABGU board, Wayne became a staunch advocate for the work of this institute and for the development of the Israel Studies International Program. A year and a half ago, he and Lisa committed a core funding required to place the program on a firm and secure foundation for years to come. They did so on a condition that AABGU undertake an effort to provide matching funds, which to be is a very, very good model. They were leveraging the Woodman Scheller Leadership Pledge. Since that time, more than 260 other contributors have joined them in their commitment, bringing us together today. It is with deep gratitude and enormous pride that I extend thanks on behalf of the university to Wayne and Lisa, to Ernie and Roberta, and to our many devoted friends and partners at AABGU who made this dedication of the Woodman Scheller Israel Studies International Program possible. Thank you. I'm going to read the inscription here. Ben Gurion University of the Negev, the Woodman Scheller Israel Studies International Program, established and generously funded through the visionary foresight of Wayne Woodman and Lisa Scheller and Roberta and Ernest Scheller Jr. Professor Kakami, BGU President, June of 2016. I am very humbled and reminded of the great American comedian Bob Hope in a similar circumstance who also said that he felt nothing but great humility at this moment, but he believed that the strength of the remaining character he had would overcome it. So to President Carmi, to Dr. Caballo, and most importantly, to Dr. Scheller, Roberta, and to my wife, Lisa, three people who this wouldn't be possible without and who have believed in me and my ideas and the initiatives that I take to convert them into reality. My parents emigrated to America in the spring of 1940 as the Nazis were crossing the French border. As new arrivals, my mom and dad wanted the very best education for me, and for reasons that I've never fully understood, sent me to 13 years of Episcopal boys' prep schools. <laughs> I was one of a handful of Jewish kids amongst a swarm of wasps. I was called a Christ killer a dirty Jew, and a kike on more occasions than I'd like to remember. A generation later, my children have never experienced anti-Semitism. And while that, that's progress, it has also weakened their ability and their generation's ability to detect the presence and the threat of this undying evil. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. It's on the rise in ways unseen since the 1930s. We still say never forget, but despite the rush of distressing events and the creeping insinuations that emanate from academic and political leaders, we tell ourselves it's not quite time to remember, not yet, not, not here in America. Perhaps non-Jews think that the growth of anti-Semitism doesn't apply to them. Well, let me tell you that we Jews may be first in line, but we are never last. We are the canary in the coal mine when evil poisons the atmosphere for freedom and for tolerance. Turning points in history begin in vacuums. Complacency allows evil to fill the void, and good people rationalize its inevitability until leaders with vision confront reality and decry those who willfully ignore it. Their vision and honesty inspire courage in those who are uninspired those who have come too late to realize that all they were trying to protect by not confronting, confronting evil, their families, friends, businesses, and way of life, is at even greater risk now. These were leaders like Lincoln, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Reagan in the West, and like Ben-Gurion in Israel. None perfect, but each perfect for their time. 
Each arrived in the aftermath of good intentions, intentional weakness, and studied gullibility. Each arrived in the wake of weak men unwilling to consider any consequences that failed to fit the false reality that they had shaped in their minds. Today, it is out of favor to speak of exceptionalism because we are once again in a time of weak leaders. But America and Israel are exceptional nations, exceptional because they are rare in history. They are better off because they are exceptional. History is nearly always a story of the strong crushing the powerless. America and Israel are rare because both have flourished as a free people, no longer subject to the dictates of thugs and autocrats. America and Israel have walked very similar paths. Both were originally settled by the religious rejects of Europe. Our wars for independence were considered futile and doomed. Both countries form new societies based on longstanding moral principles, and both are administered through an innovative form of government. Each opened her doors as a refuge for the oppressed, a frontier to pioneer a new life. And both America and Israel are under assault from forces led by radical academics and Islamic extremists. Israel is well known as startup nation, but it should be more properly known as startup civilization. Western civilization began the moment Moses came down Sinai with the law. These laws transformed human society from the tribal to the community, where shared values promoted tolerance, where property was protected from brute force, where deferred satisfaction ruled over instant gratification, and where self-interest conquered selfishness. These values are ancient but durable truths. They underlie every modern Western nation. They aren't true because they are old. They are old because they are true. There are many monuments to extinct societies, but the gift of the Jews isn't physical, but rather it's metaphysical. It's why we are not just a memory carved in a ruin, but we are still making memories long after competing cultures have receded into history. Our morals shape our existence and color the way we see the world around us. The strange bedfellows alliance between radical Islam and radical academics, between the pre-modern and the post-modern, is rooted in their mutual need to delegitimize our worldview. Radical Islam's worldview would suffocate progress in the name of dogmatic tradition. Radical academia's worldview would suppress freedom of thought in the name of doctrine. One wants to claim a monopoly over our spirits while the other wants to claim a monopoly over our minds. Should they prevail, the altar at which God affirmed his covenant with Abraham will be transformed into an altar upon which freedom and progress will be slain. Our gift will fund the advanced education of students from around the world, students who will return to their home countries armed with a depth of knowledge to speak accurately and factually on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people against growing opposition within universities and government institutions. We've heard much this week of the remarkable progress of this university from technology to science to the expansion of the campuses. And this represents its physical manifestation as as a school, as a university. But this program, this program represents its soul. There are many stories about first epiphanies at the Western Wall, but mine came in a former bomb shelter in Stabokare. It is the home of the archive of David Ben-Gurion, and as Paula Caballo, the head of the institute, translated some of Ben-Gurion's correspondence for me, I looked around that room, filled with thousands of documents written by this great man, and felt like I was inside his head, like I could feel his presence, and that moment, lives with me still and enlivens my zeal for his vision and cause. BGU and the Negev are intertwined and inseparable. It is the last region of Israel still in a pioneering stage. BGU is the manifestation of Ben-Gurion's vision. It is the school where ordinary kids go to gain the expertise, the mindset, and the will to transform both their lives and their country. It is unlikely that any one of us will be remembered 
like Ben-Gurion, as a providential leader. However, collectively, we can act on his behalf and on behalf of his vision. Each of us has made a financial commitment to the school. For some of us, it was generous. For others, sacrificial. For all of us, commendable. Yet commendable is not enough. We must each do what, for most of us, is uncomfortable. We must engage in a discussion within our communities, discussions about how our choices from the voting booth to the synagogue and from our alumni support to our charitable giving align with the ongoing interests of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. We must tune our actions until they resonate with the music of our hearts, the Song of Zion. Speaking as the son of ordinary parents who came to America to ensure extraordinary opportunities for me, I want to thank you all for this great honor in supporting this remarkable school and the Institute of Israel Studies. Thank you. Thank you.